morning. <laughs> we have a great panel here for you today. I'm Francine Glick from Barnard Class of 77. And before we kick off uh, this panel here, I want to give you a little bit of background of how this group came together to actually create this panel. About a year ago, a university-wide alumni engagement committee was formed to see how the CAA could partner with the schools to create a more positive atmosphere for women-driven volunteer initiatives across all schools and encourage inter-school partnerships and dialogue. This committee brings together female leaders from all of the Columbia University schools, including Barnard, as well as staff advisors. We've met three times since that initial meeting and have exchanged background on women's programs, mentoring initiatives, and other topics affecting women at the school level. A lot of the discussion at our meeting has centered on how we can support each other and uh, how to find ways to supplement what we are doing with other women's groups, especially in programming. We have an alumni committee subgroup so we can post articles, exchange ideas, and keep the dialogue going. The panel you are here to see today is a direct example of work done by the committee. Now, if you would like more information or to be involved or know what's coming up, um, you can either um, give me your business card at the end of the session, or you can email me at, um, I'm fglick at gmail.com, that's f-g-l-i-c-k at gmail.com, and I'll be here after the session. Um, so now I would like to introduce our moderator, Lori Magid, 85 Law, a committee member, um, who will moderate the panel called Women Leading Change. Good morning. So, is it still more difficult nowadays for women to be leaders than men? Certainly the leader of our country thinks so. On a fundraiser for Hillary Clinton on September 18, President Obama said, there's a reason why we haven't had a woman president. We as a society still grapple with what it means to see powerful women, and it still troubles us in a lot of ways unfairly. With this wonderful panel of women leaders, we are going to grapple with these issues for the next hour or so. I have a couple of prompts that I'm going to uh, throw to them based on a series of articles that the Washington Post did just last month on women in leadership. I highly recommend it. And then we're going to throw it open to you to see uh, what stories you can tell and what advice you can get from this great panel. As Francine said, I'm a 1985 uh, graduate of the law school. Before that, I was one of the relatively uh, early women at the Wharton Business School. I've been serving as president of the Law School Alumni Association since 2014, and I was the first, and so far only, uh, woman to serve as United States Attorney in Philadelphia. We have with us, uh, all the way over, Kathleen Crowley, who got both her master's and PhD in 1991 and 93 from Columbia's Mailman School of Public Policy. She's a vice president here at the university with responsibility for environmental, safety, and health concerns on five campuses. She previously worked at New York Presbyterian Hospital as the director of occupational health services. Mariam Benikarim Lerner, graduated from Barnard in 1989 and from the School of International and Public Affairs and Business School in 1993. She's currently the Global Chief Marketing Officer at Hyatt Hotels Corporation, worked many other great places as well, Gannett, NBC Universal, and Univision. And Alexis Gelber, another graduate of Barnard and a 1980 graduate of the Journalism School. She's an editorial consultant and an adjunct professor at NYU. She was awarded, this is a big deal, guys, the CAA's Alumni Medal in 2012 after chairing the Journalism Alumni Board, and she's a longtime top editor at Newsweek and will definitely have some stories to share with us from that experience. So um, the very first one that I'm going to open with, I'm going to join this great group. Um, as I said, the Washington Post has been doing this uh, series on women and leadership. And one of the very first articles that they had was titled, White House Women Want to Be in the Room Where It Happens. So for all New, York, New, New Yorkers, I've already seen it twice. That's a reference, of course, to Hamilton, 
when Aaron Burr sang his big song because Hamilton, Jefferson, and Madison left him out of the room when the 1790 Compromise was being hammered out. The Post article explains that in the early days of the Obama administration, women in the White House felt like they were being left out of the room, kind of having to elbow their way in. And then more significantly, they felt like they weren't being taken as seriously as they should be once they were in the room. But what I really love about the article is it's not just sort of presenting or complaining. It offered the strategy that they used. And the women said what they did was they used a strategy they called amplification. When one woman at a meeting spoke, another woman would then repeat the comment, making sure to credit the woman who said it. That way, the idea that was presented was given credit to the correct person and was repeated so that people made sure that they heard it. So I'm going to throw out to this panel uh, the question, did you ever feel like uh, you weren't in the room where you, you were supposed to be? How would you get in the room? And when you got in the room, what did you do to make sure that your voice was heard and you were taken seriously? And I'm going to turn to Alexis first, because she has a prop. And whoever brings a prop gets to go first. Um, <laughs> I brought, sorry. She's uh, going to tell you about Feminist Fight Club, which I highly recommend. So when I was an editor at Newsweek magazine, um, uh, I was very interested in issues of women in leadership. I'm going to just show you on my other prop. We did a series of special issues and conferences about women in leadership. This was our very first cover, How Women Lead, with Oprah on the cover. Um, the date of this was October 24, 2005. Uh, may I just add, a month after the inf now infamous Donald Trump tape that is going everywhere. <laughs> but um, one of the young people on my staff, uh, on our staff, was a writer named uh, Jessica Bennett, a very, very talented young journalist who has gone on to do all sorts of interesting things. And she's just published this um, book called Feminist Fight Club, which is um, her look at how women can deal with um, difficult situations in the workplace. And it's written in a very fun, colloquial style. Lori has taken a look at it. Cartoons and everything, very <laughs> funny labels. I love the mother ducker. Right, and there are sort of funny words that she makes up, and a lot of the language is, uh, you, know, um, you know, pretty confrontational and raw, but it is fun. And she has a couple of different categories for experiences that I think many of us have had in the workplace. So one of them is she calls, one um, kind of thing is she says, uh, we've often uh, had to deal with the manterrupter. The me men apparently, this, I mean, data has borne this out, men interrupt more frequently than women do. Um, and she has what she calls, she sort of describes the phenomenon and she says they're fight moves. So her fight moves are, include, keep talking. Just keep talking when you've been interrupted. Uh, maintain the momentum of what you're saying. Um, another suggestion is lean in, literally. She said, assert your physical space. Studies show that men do this all the time. And you can just, you know, we, we can watch the debate on Sunday night again to see if that happened. But, um, but that is just practical advice. Another category is what she calls the bro-propriator. This is a man who appropriates um, and even takes credit for a woman's idea, which is what um, the article that Lori was talking about referred to. Her fight moves include use uh, active authoritative words. When a man appropriates your idea, say, yes, that's exactly the point I was making. Or, thanks for picking up on my idea. Um, she also suggests having email evidence that you can circulate. Um, and that she also encourages women to like another woman's idea, which was the point yes. of the Obama um, women. Um, she, has, uh, she also talks about the mansplainer, a word that has entered, I think, even the OED now 
uh, it has become so commonplace uh, to refer to a man who sort of explains things to women in the room, even colleagues and peers, and even sometimes people <laughs> above his rank, in a patronizing manner. Um, she also talks about the imitator. This is a man who restates what women say and um, then gets the credit for it. Again, it's a lot like the bro-propriator. Her fight move is for you to say, I love having your feedback on my idea. <laughs> <laughs> or confront him. <clears throat> Anyway, there are more of these um, sort of tips and uh, kind of very colorful ways of conjuring up these workplace experiences that I think uh, many of us in this room can relate to. Thank you. Do you want to jump in? Great. Uh, good morning, fellow Colombians. So great to be here and to be here with all of you. So um, my experience comes from the background of being in academia and healthcare, and so. Um, there's a couple of things that I want to say, and one is confidence. And if you haven't read Claire Shipman's Confidence Code, mm -hmm. I could have brought a copy with me today. It's an absolute must. And the bottom line is, why do we as women feel we need to be 110% at something, and men feel if they're 40%, it's good enough? So really, have the confidence in yourself. When you enter that room, it's important to have a seat at the table. Don't take those seats around the table. Have a seat at the table. My next advice is to listen. Listen, listen, listen to what's being said. And when it's time to speak, I'd like to say something. And then it's about the tone with which you say it in. And I think that that is really important, at least in the environment that I'm in. You say it with confidence, you, you say it with belief. There's no whining, there's no being a bee. And that's an important way to get heard at the table. Um, and to do that, of course, it takes the courage. And uh, you have to really believe in you to do that. All right, I'm actually going to go to the next uh, kind of issue, because I know Mariam's got something good to say about this. For those of you that have not met Mariam or seen her speak before, she is a dynamic speaker with her own unique style. So <laughs> the next kind of issue I wanted to throw out there was judging women's voices and leadership style. And for that, rather than the post, I'm going to go to Instagram, which my kids actually have me figuring out a little bit how to use Instagram now. And one that uh, Hillary Clinton posted just a couple of weeks ago, um, I'll just read you a snippet of it. I'm not Barack Obama. I'm not Bill Clinton. Both of them carry themselves with a naturalness that is very appealing to audiences. Women are seen through a different lens. It's not bad, it's just a fact. I'll go to these events and there will be men speaking before me and they'll be pounding the message and screaming about how we need to win the election. And people love it. And I want to do the same thing because I care about this stuff. But I've learned that I can't be so passionate in my presentation. I love to wave my arms, but apparently that's a little bit scary to people. <laughs> and I can't yell too much. It comes across as too loud, too shrill, too this, too that. So my question for this group is, do women have a different voice? Are they judged differently? And have you changed the way you present yourself or given other people advice on how they present themselves to really get your point across? So I guess I'm going first on that one. Um, you know, I think it's a really interesting debate. I never really, I mean, obviously I recognize I'm a woman because, you know, I look in the mirror. Um, <laughs> but I never really saw myself through that lens. And I heard L.A. Reid speak recently, and he was talking about his success, and he said, I chose not to see the obstacles. I chose not to see them. Mm -hmm. And my husband looked at me and he said, that's you. And I think for me, I could have, I could have seen myself, I was always in a room with lots of men. I was in the media business, that was generally the way. Um, and that's generally the way when you're in the boardroom. Mm -hmm. And I could, have, I could have seen myself as the woman. I could have seen myself as the Iranian. I could have seen myself as the immigrant. That would have been such a weight to carry um, that it would have been difficult. And so I was fortunate. I mean, like the keynote speaker before, I had, them, I had a mother who always thought you could be whoever you wanted to be. She still says that to me. It's super annoying. 
<laughs> um, but, but she raised us that way, right? We, I was fortunate that I came from a family of very strong women, and so I sort of just, I just like put it out of my head. And if you don't put it out of your head, that voice becomes very loud and it will get in your way. And so I would say to you, it was interesting, I was telling these guys as we were preparing, I was on a panel and I, was, I recognized that I was younger than the other women on this panel, and they were giving, advi they were giving advice to millennials. And they were, um, one of the women was telling them that sh they should always wear red lipstick, like it was, um, she was like, you know, it's really important. And she was an older lawyer. She was quite successful. She said, you know, it was almost like armor. She wore the red lipstick. And I, it was so hard for me to hold back. Um, and I was like, you don't have to wear red lipstick if you don't want. This is not a L'Oreal ad. <laughs> and I think I learned early that it, for me, and I recognize, listen, I recognize where we stand on the shoulders of people who came before us, right? People had to wear bow ties and fit in. By the time my generation came in, we didn't have to do that. And so I remember early on working for a guy who is sort of a genius, one of the you know, biggest billionaires in the country, going to his office when I worked at Univision in LA, and people saying to me, when you go to Jerry's office, people whisper, and women have to wear hose, and he really doesn't like women to wear pantsuits. And I was like, well, that's too bad. I don't wear hose, and if that's gonna be an issue, then I'm not the right person to work here. And so I used to go to Jerry's office, and I mean, I didn't yell, because you know you do have to think about the environment that you're in, but I wasn't gonna be wearing hose. And if that was gonna be an issue, then that wasn't gonna be the right job for me, and I was gonna be moving on. Now, I will tell you, I've had, you know, in my 30-year career, I've had over 11 jobs. That makes me a millennial before my time. Um, <laughs> You know, people say to me all the time, I meet people who say, even on this trip, I have, a lot of, I have a lot of people who went to business school with me, international affairs school with me, who are not happy in their jobs, and they haven't been happy in their jobs for a long time. And I find that confusing because when I'm unhappy in a job, I leave. It may take me a year, it may take me two years, but you know, I sort of feel like it's a two-way street. And so I'm willing to leap, and I would tell all of you, like, if you work for someone, where it's really difficult, and I have worked for those people. I remember working for a guy who thought I should organize his fundraising events because you know I was the CMO, but why don't I help him raise money for some charity? He was the. I was like, I'm not going to stay here. That is like not my life. So, I mean, I think we're fortunate in that we stand on the shoulders of women who had to do that. And today, I don't think you have to do that. And I think that you have to be your authentic self because otherwise, the price you pay for Compromising that is a really, really high price, and I think life is too short. And if that's the environment that you have to work in, you might want to consider working for somebody else. And the good news is there are other options. Now, talking about moving from job to job, Kathleen, can you talk a little bit about maybe different expectations in different industries about how a woman is going to present herself and kind of how far you can go. Like you want to be your authentic self, but in certain industries there are expectations about how everyone, not just women, but men and women are going to present themselves. I think that's a good question. I think I'm probably old enough to be Miriam's mother. So I don't know about that. <laughs> my leadership style has evolved. So the leader that I was in my 30s is different than the leaders I was in my 40s and the leader that I am in my 50s. And while I feel now my role as a leader is to grow people, I first had to learn to grow myself. And that did begin by having someone who was a mentor to me who saw in me things that I wasn't able to see in myself. And I think that's a really important lesson as we grow is to see those skills in others and to help you to evolve and to move from, in my case, I worked in a hospital setting, I had a career in medicine that was not well recognized, I was a woman, I was young, um, to come over to the academic university side and to lead a, a very large health and safety program for a large organization. As Miriam said, the only way I could survive, and there were no quotes or references on it, was to not see gender, to not see age, and to really believe in myself because I knew that others believed in me. And so that's really important, is to connect with someone who can be a mentor, who can be a role model, believe in yourself, that cup is half full, and move forward in a very authentic way. I, I wouldn't wear red lipstick. Um, wouldn't even thought to wear red lipstick, but you have to be who you really are. 
people don't care how much you know until they know how much you care, and that needs to come across. And certainly in the industry that I work in, which is dealing with scientists who are incredibly smart and are very knowing, and maybe they don't have the common sense that Sheena talked about, but they have the sense. And it is really important to find ways to bridge, to work with that community, uh, because they don't really care what I have to say until they know that I care about them. So I think that is, is really important to take that with you as your careers evolve. I like wearing red lipstick, and I was afraid <laughs> at my first job interviews that that would be a little too, you know, stand out-ish because, uh, you know, in the journalism world, you're supposed to be, at least when I came into the profession, you're supposed to be one of the guys. And I just thought maybe this is too much, but then I figured it's what I wear. Um, you know, I, th I think that you can always become a better leader. It's really like being a writer. You know, you can always improve your writing. I mean, this is something I really learned at Barnard. Uh, I read tips about writing all the time. I mean, you can always improve those skills. And leadership is, um, sometimes you are born with an instinct for it, but the actual practice of it is a skill. And you can always improve those skills by learning from other people. All right, uh, next one we're going to sort of move to is in order to become a leader, uh, sometimes you just fall into it and have incredible luck, but not usually. Usually you are building on relationships and you need to know people. Um, so the topic of networking and related to that mentoring and kind of my little uh, prompt story there is um, I live in Philadelphia and um, Philadelphia has a history of these various clubs that only men could belong to, but now, of course, they have to let women have members as well. Um, so my husband belongs to one of these clubs, and they absolutely have women members now, but it was a longtime <laughs> men's club, and most people there play squash, which I don't, but I sometimes go as his spouse and work out on the machines. And the women's locker room is a perfectly nice locker room. Got benches to sit on and put your little sneakers on, and it's got lockers and sinks and showers and all that stuff. But I had been hearing about the men's locker room mm -hmm. from my two sons, who do play squash, <laughs> and my husband. So, true confessions, I know this is being taped, but true confessions anyway. Uh, we were there very after hours. My husband and sons confirmed that there was no one in the men's locker room, and they took me in to see it. <laughs> <laughs> Big couches! TVs, marble uh, showers and things, um, menus and a bar so that you could order food and drinks and sit around, apparently not fully clothed. So, <laughs> so my question is, are women still missing opportunities? I know we can play squash and golf if we want to, but I've tried and I don't. That's that, not happening. Are, are there still opportunities that men have, even nowadays, whether it's at clubs or golf or squash? And what can we do about that? Do we have alternative networking opportunities? And does it make mentoring even more important for women than men? So does anybody want to try that one? I mean, no question that, you know, they live a different rarefied world. I mean, that's just the deal, right? And so I think, you know, I think women actually will get together and support each other. One of the things I learned from Ellen Futter, because she was president of Barnard when I was there, was that she actually, um, in her 20s, got a group of women together. I think there was a bunch of them that did that. And they sort of created their own feminist fight club. It wasn't mm -hmm. called that. And they gathered, actually, it's funny, I was in town earlier this week, and I ran into her. They gather at Michael's, and there they were. Leslie Stahl, Anna Quinlan, Ellen Futter, and uh, the other group that was there. They weren't all those people when they joined. They were in their 20s, so they weren't all you know, fabulous and at the peak of their career, but they've sort of kept together. And it was a great, great idea. And I always said that would be an interesting thing to do. So about 15 years ago, I kept having this idea, and I sort of said to a group of women who I thought were interesting, I said, why don't you each bring someone, and let's all try to get together you know, every couple of months for lunch. And it was great, and it was really hard because everybody was busy and not everybody showed up, but what happened was 
it wasn't just a networking event. People were successful in their own right. They weren't all there looking for a job, right? It changed the dynamic. But before long, everybody started doing business together. Somebody was a filmmaker, somebody was a publisher. She would say, oh, there's a great book coming up. Oh, I'd be interested in optioning that. And they sort of became a support network right. of their own. It's support as much as networking, because you're, you're going to be a better, more confident leader if you know you've got your whole posse telling you you're great, you're wonderful. Well, I mean, I think you ha we all have sort of a kitchen cabinet of people you turn to in that moment where you have a question. They can be men, they can be women. And I think, um, yes, is it, do men still have opportunities and uh, there are still clubs that don't allow women, right? Instead of my going to chase that, I'm focused on finding ways to like do the things I'm interested right. in. I'm, my husband's a big golfer. When we moved to Chicago, I had to go get, um, with him to get interviewed for this club that he wanted to join, I felt like I was in Bye Bye Birdie. It was right. like, <laughs> you know, and they kept saying, like, we'd love for you to come. And it's an interesting juxtaposition because my right. husband, since we moved to Chicago, doesn't work, right? And that's a new paradigm that's come to the fray. And it's interesting for him to be the spouse right. and be Mr. Banakaram, because yeah. I never changed my name. That's not so great for him either. So, I mean, I think the paradigm is changing. And so we really have to recognize like, I'm not going to go join the golf club and start picking up golf because that's how people do business because I don't care. And I know it would be good for me. And in the media business, so many deals got done on the golf course. Guess what? I'm not going to go play golf. I'm not interested. So I'm going to find people who want to go to the theater. And so what? That'll be who I'll be doing business right. with. And I think, like, yes, does it exist? Will it constantly exist? Of course. But I think you have to find the things you're passionate about and connect with those people authentically. Because guess what? Forcing myself to become a golfer, I'm never going to be that person, right? And that's OK. And I think like you have to give yourself permission to be who you were meant to be. Um, I've seen a complete transformation of my profession in my adult life since I graduated from Barnard College. Um, when I was hired at Newsweek magazine, um, I thought I was being hired because I was uh, a good writer and I had good clips from my first job and from my time at Columbia Journalism <coughs> School. But then I found out a little more about the history of Newsweek and less than 10 years before I arrived there, uh, the women of Newsweek filed a class action lawsuit to be promoted above the level of secretary and researcher. <coughs> Uh, this is now the subject of this is the subject of a book written by a former colleague of mine, The Good Girls Revolt. It's now a series on Amazon Prime Video with all the names changed to protect the guilty. Um, but uh, um, but uh, part of the stipulation of that lawsuit was that every department of the magazine had to have one woman writer, and. Um, uh, when I was interviewed for the job, um, the managing editor of the magazine said, well, what are you interested in doing? And I said, I have this background in the arts. And he said, are you interested in writing f about international news? And I said, yes. <laughs> and that was because the one woman writer in Newsweek International had just left. Right. And I was the inadvertent beneficiary of the women's lawsuit. And Anna Quinlan, who was my classmate at Barnard, told the same story about getting hired at the New York Times, because they followed Newsweek with a class action lawsuit. And um, so when I started at Newsweek, um, there were very few women in leadership positions. Um, but the male bosses I had were real mentors and were very sympathetic. My first boss. Rick Smith, who's on the board of Columbia Journalism School. Um, the first day I started work, there he was and with his six-year-old daughter. Uh, he said he had a story meeting, and his daughter sat in on the story meeting. He said, babysitting issues. And she followed him around all day. And I thought, wow. Isn't that great? Um, so that was a very kind of supportive environment for a woman who was thinking about a future. But I made it a point to always reach out to younger women and to kind of stay in touch with them and to um, try to be a mentor. Um, and um, things changed in the time that I was able to see a change. Mm -hmm.
Well, I'm, I'm just going to say, because it's so interesting. I had a backgrounder interview with a New York Times reporter this week, and she, she's the branding marketing reporter, mm -hmm. Sapna, and she was saying to me, why is it that it's so top of mind in the advertising agency business? If you haven't seen that, this year it's like the year of the woman, as if it hasn't been the year of the woman, for God's sakes, for the last 30 years. Mm -hmm. um, but there was a lawsuit of J. Walter Thompson, which has led to um, Kevin Smith, Kevin Roberts saying something and him being moved from his job at Saatchi and Saatchi. And so there's this whole thing where clients are saying, if you don't have enough women on my business, you're not going to be my agency, right? Mm -hmm. So they're using their economic power to create change. And she said to me, why do you think it's such a big deal all of a sudden? I said, I don't know, because it's not like women haven't been around until this year. And frankly, this conversation has been around since I've been in the business. Right. And, you know, I think that um, we do have a responsibility to recognize that that's the reality and ask for change. But I find it confusing as a business leader because I think to be successful in business, you have to reflect the people who you serve. And if you look at your audience, they're diverse, not just from a gender perspective, from a, you know, demographic perspective. <laughs> so how people cannot see what's there in front of them in census data is confusing to me. But it is the reality. And as much as things change, they're still the same, right? I mean, they change at Newsweek and the New York Times to some degree, but they're having that same conversation because of lawsuits in the advertising business today, not in the era of Mad Men, today. My daughter, who is um, uh, about to turn 30, um, didn't think that she was a feminist when she was in high school and college because you know, the girls did better than the boys. Right. They graduated with honors. Uh, they killed it, you know, academically, uh, in terms of awards. Mm -hmm. And then they entered the work world. <laughs> and what a shock that was to them. Uh, because they discovered that the guys that they were, you know, you know, beating for all the awards in college were suddenly getting promoted faster than they were. Uh, my daughter's a filmmaker and a video editor, and um, you know she had a film that made it into um, some festivals, and she was often the only woman on the stage there. There are certain fields that are still less yes. representative of the population at large in so many different ways, demographically and in terms of gender. So it's a shock. Right. I do think that one of the things, I mean, we're, everybody's here because they are a Columbia alum leader, and one of the things that we can do is make sure that we're doing mentoring to supplement look, perhaps lost networking opportunities. I mean, I have found, um, as a mother, uh, that one of the things that I do is not so much necessarily be mentoring my friends, but be mentoring my friends' kids, and they're mentoring mine. So when a friend has a kid that wants to go to law school, they send them to me. When my kid wants to go to med school, I send them to them. Um, so that's another way that, that you can just help if you lose those opportunities. And I think you've done sure. a good bit of mentoring. I'd like to add, right? on, yes, to add on that. So that mentor that I talked about who saw me before I saw myself, um, his name was Robert Louie, and he was a physician, and he was a father of two daughters. And I, I think it's important to talk that the mentor it doesn't always need to be the woman. Mm -hmm. I also, my father, I was the youngest of three girls. He had no sons. He was an only child. And so there was no male figure aside from my father. So he taught me to be independent and to believe in myself. And at this stage in my career, I talked about how I think it's important that I grow people and grow my team. I think for one, I do spend a lot of time on mentorship from high school kids, college kids, graduate students, and postgraduate students. One of the things that we're doing very well at Mailman is we have this mentorship committee and we have a mentorship program and we all sign up to spend some time to mentor uh, Mailman students. And it's great and it's what we should be doing. Um, very important that my daughter, who now works for Facebook, a few years ago said, Mom, you have to read Lean In with Sheryl Sandberg. I got the book, couldn't put it down, and I said, I'm going to start a Lean In circle it on my, at my team. We have 50 safety professionals. I'm going to take all of the women. And I did a luncheon, and each of them had the book at the table. And I did a little presentation. And I said, let's talk about a Lean In moment. And I led off. 
And a lean-in moment that may not make sense to you now, but certainly made sense to me, having had my daughter in the 80s, before internet, email, mobile, text, I don't know how I had a baby with any of that. <laughs> not a lot of childcare options. And um, I wrote a proposal to my boss and sent it by a FedEx and request to have 15 minutes to talk to him to ask if I could return at a four day work week. That was like unheard of, there wasn't flexible work time. But I said to my husband and I said to my daughter Hannah, at six weeks, eight weeks, if I don't do this, the worst that he could say is no. All I'm asking is could I have a pilot project to try return to work four days a week. And uh, I felt so good sending that off. You know, I had to wait days to get the appointment and whatnot. And, and P.S., he said, great, let's give it a try. Because my mentor, my boss, knew that it was important to me and that I was going to work six days a week, um, which, which I did. And I had the good fortune to be able to do that for a number of years, had a second kid, um, until I got a new boss that was a woman, and she didn't know me. She basically gave me an ultimatum and said, if you don't start working five days a week, presents on Monday, you won't have a job. So, um, so sometimes you learn from, from things that don't work so well. And I've, I've taken that with me on how important it is to understand our needs in the workplace. So that little lean in circle, we meet every year and a different woman leans in to lead the theme of what it is that we're gonna, what we're gonna do. And it's just a great t tradition. And the men said, what about me? <laughs> I said, you're welcome to do something like that. <laughs> well, that's a good lead into the next topic, which is we're constantly hearing about work-life balance. So a, a little bit of a, a twist on that is very often the advice that women are given is, well, just work harder, just work harder. Um, and one of the, funny stories that I liked in Feminist Fight Club was she was um, saying to people, you need to be the mother ducker in the <laughs> office, meaning that stop being the person that not just is asked, perhaps inappropriately, to get the coffee, stop being the person that is the office mom that says, oh, I'll make sure that we, that we have good pastry, and I'll make sure that I get everything organized, and that I take care of everybody. Um, stop doing that. And when I read that, I thought, Oh, you know, I definitely did do all of those things. Like even when I was the U.S. Attorney and we're trying to, you know, make these big decisions about fighting crime, when the Attorney General comes to visit the office, I'm also thinking, God, we have to have some really nice pastry to serve him, and how are we going to do that? We don't have a budget. Again, in the true confessions, you're not allowed to spend any money on anything at the Department of Justice, so I made my husband, who has his own catering company, make at home one of the Attorney General's favorite dishes and bring it over, but that's a whole different story. I should not have really been spending time on that. Um, but even if you become a mother ducker at the office, um, what about the whole rest of life, where I think many of us, even if we have very enlightened husbands, spouses, partners, whoever, we are still often the executive assistant. I know, and my husband would admit, somehow I'm the executive assistant in the family planning the vacations, the social arrangements, all of that. So how do we both work harder, work smarter, and still be often the executive assistant? What are your experiences? <laughs> there is no such thing as yes. balance. Let's just start with that. That's <laughs> just the wrong word. <laughs> it's such a fallacy. Yes. <laughs> It's such a fallacy. It's like when we tell kids in preschool that life is fair. Guess right. what? It's not fair. It's like when we tell women or men that there's work-life balance. Guess what? There is no such thing as work-life balance. What you have is chapters, and those are decisions that you right. make. In some chapters of your life, you will work more and have less balance. And in other chapters, you will make different decisions. Thinking that there's a balance sets you up to actually be frustrated all the time. Mm -hmm. I have no hobbies. People say to me, what are your hobbies? I'm like. I, when I was at Columbia, I really did have hobbies. I'm like, oh my God, I'm becoming Hillary Clinton. I have no hobbies. And she's getting criticized for having right. no hobbies. You can't have a job like me and be involved in your children's life and have hobbies. Right. Right. Like, come on, let's right. be honest. No, I'm with you. I have no hobbies either. I don't play golf. I don't play My squash, hobby is my job and my scrum. children right. and my family. I don't know. I, I think there are times, um, as Mary Ann was saying, that when you are doing everything, 
You know, particularly when you have, if you have children and if you have young children, um, I often, I was working full time or more than full time and I had two kids and I was, you know, head of the overseas press club and I was on the Columbia J School alumni board or the Barnard alumni board. And, and I mean, I think I just had more energy or I was just kind of this sense, I think, that you're kind of alluding to that a woman must do it all must be perfect at everything. It's not really a question of being the executive assistant, it's just somehow you have to be the superwoman. And this is something which goes to, I think, the point you were making in the beginning about, you know, why do we not have enough confidence in ourselves? That we have to be perfect in every realm of our lives. And I think that that's um, a kind of superhuman thing that we are expecting of ourselves. Um, the other thing I just wanted to touch on that, uh, that you were saying uh, is that I think that in the workplace, it, this is, goes back to leadership yeah. styles, you know, we accept all kinds of styles of male leadership. We accept the guy who's the strong, silent type. We accept the guy who's the hearty backslapper. Mm -hmm. We um, don't like, but we have worked for the guy who yells all the time and has very little impulse control. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, we, we are not surprised by any of that. You know, and there are all sorts of other kinds of expressions right. of male leadership. But women um, seem to think that, you know, they are sort of stereotyped as either the nurturer, the one who thinks about the pastry, or the bitch. Right. right. The devil wears Prada. <laughs> right. And there's sort of nothing in the middle. There's nothing on the edges. Um, and that's just not human nature, as a matter of fact. But um, uh, I think it's very hard for particularly women leaders to break through yes. those kinds of preset images. Um, it's hard for political women political leaders to do it. It's hard for CEOs to do it. But. I think that what Alexa said is very important and what I tried to say in answer to the first question is about that tone, right? Because you're a whiner or you're the devil wears Prada. And so I, I do think that that tone is important. I think that uh, there was a time when I didn't have any time for anything but my family, my work, and what I found worked was surrounding myself by like-minded women because I didn't want to have the guilt that I was working and having a family and my struggles I knew were not unique to me and it was so very helpful to just connect with the like-minded and to surround myself with that. And you know, nurture the nurturer. So if it meant to go get um, a massage or go for a run or um, just take a little time out for yourself, I found that really, really important. Um, maybe you, I started a book club because I love to read and to be able to have a night out once a month with women and talk about literature or what have you. And, and those were the things that were important to me. To Miriam's point, I mean, I never thought about joining the golf club or competing with the men at the table. It was a totally different uh, strategy that I had in my mind, is that they were them and I am I, and this is how I'm gonna move forward and I'm gonna build on my experiences in that way. And nobody is perfect, that's also a fallacy. Right? I mean, I'm not perfect in any of the things I do. I'd like to meet the perfect person, because if you know them, please introduce them. It would be really helpful to see what perfection really looks like. You know, the thing that I find super interesting, my career has been all about transformation and change. I'm brought in when people are trying to behave differently, and it's a torrential experience, right? I, for whatever reason, I grew up in revolution. It's like I thrive in chaos. I've learned that about myself, right? <laughs> That's not for everyone. But what it means is you have to be all in when you're in that experience because that's the only way you survive and thrive in that environment. So I think part of it's also recognizing who you are in the environment in which you're going to do your best job. And then look for people who recognize your talents and skills, right? If there's a disconnect, you're just never gonna be happy. The reason it's okay for me to say I have no hobbies and yes, of course, I'd like to have more hobbies and more free time. And the thing that I sacrifice is like I eat terribly and forget to work out, right? Like you give up on yourself first. So we all recognize that. Um, I guess that's the first step. But, um, but I think the thing is, I like my job, right? And so my job gives me joy. I actually have impact in, at, at work. And that's actually an incredibly satisfying thing. I have many moments where I say to myself, 
how did an immigrant girl from Iran end up on the White House lawn? Mm -hmm. Like, I have those moments. I appreciate like that it wasn't just hard work because people all work hard, but also luck, right? I mean, I recognize all those things, and I also mm -hmm. recognize the responsibility I have as a leader of an organization. I have a global job. When I go to Dubai, it's much different for women in Dubai than it is in the States, right? Mm -hmm. We complain about that here. Yeah. Go to the Middle East. Right. You know, the owners, they're not that interested when I show up in the same way that they are when a man shows up. Mm -hmm. I know that. I grew up in the Middle East, but I don't take it personally. But when women want to take a picture with me, I said to, I called for my first trip to Dubai. I said to my children, the woman who walked me up, the guest relations woman, she was so excited. She wanted to take a selfie with me. And it was like I was a celebrity. And my daughter goes, you are so not a celebrity. <laughs> I said, no, I know. You just need a teenager in your life to bring you right down. And um, I said, no, I know. But I recognized that for them, there weren't that many examples, right? So part of my role is to just be there and show you that it's possible. And you know, I, we're laughing because I gave a speech a couple weeks ago. And you know, the, I have this thing where it's like, if I can do it, you can do it. And mm -hmm. that is actually true. Because I didn't come from, I mean, I, I didn't have all kinds of connections. I didn't have parents who got me that first job. And I have that moment, like, if I can be in this seat, guess what? Anybody can be in this seat. And just knowing that it's possible, and my not hiding that and pretending like I was entitled and being willing to tell you the actual truth, it means you can do it too. Because it doesn't seem insurmountable. And that is the truth. Here, here. All right, I'm going to uh, move our panel in a slightly different direction because, again, we're all uh, Columbia alum leaders, and one of the things that leaders do is fundraising and development. So, um, just a little snippet from another one of these Washington Post articles from last month. Um, they profiled California Congresswoman Karen Bass and said, When Karen Bass was elected to the California Assembly in 2004, a city council member gave her a tone deaf piece of advice. Don't act like the other women in Sacramento. Women are only interested in policy, the council member warned Bass. They're not interested in power and fundraising. Don't be like all other women. So my question for the panel is, um, as alumni leaders, we do some development. But also in our profession, we ask for money for our organizations. We ask for money um, for ourselves, and at least the, the legend is that women don't like to ask for money. So I'll, I'll start it with Alexis. How do you, how do you ask for money? Um, you know, it's, um, it's a very important thing. And as you were saying about sending this FedEx package with this proposal to work four days a week, you know, it, you don't know the answer until you ask. Um, I did have the experience early on in my career where I was asked to be an editor, fill in as an editor, and I was editing, and uh, it went on and on and on. And I, I never hesitated to ask for a raise throughout my career. I mean, this is just maybe something that was instilled in me at Barnard or in my family. But it's like I never had a problem sort of asking for a raise. But I asked for a raise and a promotion because I was doing the work of an editor, and I was still at a writer's title. And my bosses kept explaining, well, there was going to be a change. There was a new editor coming in. He would have to make that decision. And it went on and on and on. And finally, I just decided I was dealing with male bosses. Mm -hmm. um, maybe it's a stereotype, but men understand facts and figures. So I compiled a list of all of the stories I had edited and um, all the cover stories I had edited vis-a-vis -vis what my ma two male colleagues were doing who had the title. And I went in and I said, you know, I am doing more than a third of all of the work every week, including, you know, at least one or, we had different international editions, one or two cover stories every week. And yet, I do not have that title that my colleagues have, and I certainly don't have the salary. That, I'm assuming I don't have the salary that they have. And once, and I, and I gave him the list, and um, it was what we would now think of as data-driven evidence, <laughs> right? And he looked at the list and said, hmm. And shortly after that, maybe they were afraid of another women's lawsuit, but um, I got 
a title change. I became a senior editor. I got Bravo. a salary increase, and I got a bonus. <laughs> so, nice work. But I think in any way that you have to ask, right. as a development leader, as an alumni leader, it cannot hurt to ask, but you know, it's always good to present the evidence. Right, right, and I, and I find that that's what I do, maybe because I'm a lawyer, so I, mm -hmm. I advocate. Um, I find it a lot easier to ask for money, whether mm -hmm. it's for myself or whether it's for Columbia, rather than just sort of saying, please give, it would be good, we know mm -hmm. each other with facts. This yes. is what your money did. This is what Columbia did with your money. This is, this is a specific story about a specific student whose life was changed. Right. And then it's easier, it's easier to ask. Right. And I think it's, 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 it's more persuasive, but also it's, um, you know, reality-based. Right. And it's not, I mean, I think sometimes people think that women exist in this kind of, you know, hazy mommy realm of kind of just good feelings, please give because it's the right thing to do. But no, it's, it's not only is it the right thing to do, it has changed these people's lives. We've seen these changes. Um, here's the, here are the facts and figures to back that up. And it makes a better case.